Hello and welcome to the Guitar Hang Podcast. I'm your host, John Stancor. Today's hang is with the remarkable Gretchen Men. As the guitarist for Zeparella, Gretchen has redefined what it means to pay homage to the legends. But Gretchen's love for music doesn't stop at rock. She is equally passionate about orchestral arrangements and harmony. In my exclusive interview, we'll uncover Gretchen Men's remarkable accomplishments, her unwavering influence of Jimmy Page, and the musical landscape she traverses as a master of both guitar and orchestra. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell for notifications. And now, let's hang with Gretchen Men. Okay. All right. First time meeting you. Yeah, how <laughs> we, are you? We haven't had a conversation for 20 minutes. <laughs> That's right. Well, summing up what I said, I love the, love the new album. Fantastic. Uh, I love hearing it as, as you presented it. And, and uh, the, the track listing was, you know, great to hear it. Uh, the one thing I didn't say earlier when we were not recording was it seemed very cinematic in a way that I was, it was perhaps something that was uh a, an appendice to a movie of some kind it was very cinematic very epic mm. so i thought have you ever had any forays into uh or any interest in uh, composing for film because i think it it really was very evocative well first thank you so much that means a lot um your ears don't deceive you i'm currently well it, this it's more recent than that um than, than abandon all hope, but I'm currently getting a master's degree, or actually an MFA in film composition and orchestration. Uh, so that's, that's as of as of I'm one year into the program, or a little bit more than a year. In. Yeah, that's yeah. fabulous. Yeah, I was uh, as excited as I was to talk to somebody that was obviously uh, loved Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, and had spent a lot of time absorbing zeppelin and jimmy page and all that kind of stuff i was equally excited to talk to somebody that um had actually done some um transcribing and and uh, studying frank zappa stuff the girl in a magnesium dress and cheek your broody uh tango i was like oh my gosh that's i just earlier today and i'll edit this out because it's really it's only between you and i i just interviewed dweezil zappa and we were talking about a lot of stuff earlier today but um, and he's talking about because uh, he's really deep into the composing thing now. So I'm very excited to hear from you as to where you're, where you see your path going. Awesome. Um, yeah, Dweezil's fantastic. And, and in all fairness, I did do the, the studies on the girl in the magnesium dress and the shake your booty tango. By the way, you're one of the only people who's actually like found that before chatting. So I'm, I'm super excited like that you're a fellow Zappa fan. Um, I did rely on, at least for the Shake Your Booty Tango, the Steve Vai transcriptions of that. So mm -hmm. I, I um, and then uh, Girl in the Magnesium Dress, somehow I got my hands on some sheet music for that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, I've always had an interest in composition. I've even found that the guitar players who I've really, who've stuck with me the most, you know, Steve Morse, uh, Jeff Beck, you know, um, the, the albums that I find myself listening to a lot, it doesn't have the guitar as like the only voice. It, it, they rely on a lot more interplay between instruments, which for me, I just find so engaging. And so I think my natural inclination was in that direction. Um, one of the things that I always really have loved about Steve Morris albums is the musical landscapes that he explores. A typical Steve Morris band album will have your rock songs. It'll have some stuff that's more mellow and melodic it always seems to have a bluegrass tune and something that yeah. sounds kind of baroque and i love that so i think that was it was very natural for me to want to go more towards what i like to listen to so yeah. i studied composition in school and an undergraduate degree does not mean that you can write counterpoint effectively so i've <laughs> continued my studies of that i've continued my studies of orchestration I decided to get my MFA. Well, first I was going to get a master's uh, just for media composition. So composing for like film, uh, television games. And then I realized that I could get an MFA in the same program by also getting a degree in orchestration. And something I do literally in my free time, you know, is 
study scores, you know, and, you know, grab passages from Debussy or Stravinsky or anything oh, wow. that, before I'm like, oh, I want to steal this and do something kind of like this in this next passage. So uh, I figured I might as well get the degree for it if I'm if I'm doing it on my own. Plus, you have the benefit of having feedback from professionals as opposed to just kind of trying to work well as a student yeah. on your own. Yeah, the, it's it's fabulous to and we were all we're we're here under the auspices of the Guitar Hang podcast. All these conversations go a million different directions, but the through line is the guitar. But the players that I talk to, uh, like yourself or Dweezil or Lyle Workman, express oh, what you just expressed, the idea of not necessarily having the guitar as the featured instrument all the time, but a color. And if it is a guitar, it might be baritone guitar, it might be classical guitar, it might be a Nashville tune guitar, but having it as a an interesting color in the tapestry of your composition, which I think ultimately is the most exciting thing. I, I, can't, I can't imagine being uh, in, in a room where a orchestra is playing a piece that you've written. I think that would be incredibly thrilling for as much as I love Frank and he's a huge inspiration. The thing that I love the most is stuff like Yellow Shark or, or the LSO record or yeah. um, any of the any of the, the classical stuff it just blows me away. I just love that whole thing. So did you uh, have a an early beginning in Verez and Stravinsky and Bartok and parts? And um, Stravinsky, I uh earlier but i think like a lot of people this is so goofy to say but any kid who grew up on like disney classics you oh. know fantasia right i mean that's where i learned about beethoven's pastoral symphony and you know and stravinsky right you know yeah. with uh, yeah. uh the rite of spring uh zappa you know i th gosh there's so many bartok i've gotten more into verez is you know i'm aware that he was a huge inspiration for Zappa, but I, you know, there's so many hours in the day and I still haven't listened to all of Mozart, you know? <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Uh, it's amazing that anybody, including myself, mostly myself has time for social media when I haven't read all of Shakespeare or listened to all of Mozart. I, it's like, I gotta do that. Otherwise I'm gonna regret every moment I've spent on TikTok. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but, um, I love Zappa. Actually, I'm going to be performing with the Utah Symphony in April. That's amazing. Um, a, a concerto written by Stephen Mackey. That's what's on my musical stand right now. Uh, for So I'm going to be the soloist in a guitar concerto. And I just found out one of the things we're also going to be performing is G-Spot Tornado, um, an eight oh, guitar man. version of that. So that, uh, that, yeah, that, I couldn't be happier about it. Scared, but happy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, I think that's the, th the thing that one uh, as a musician kind of has to live for is that, you know, continue to push and move forward and seeing what's possible. So anytime I hear about musicians that are going to school for something or learning something or, you know, composing, orchestrating, even, even if it's just small string quartets for an acoustic project, it's yeah. very cool to expand your horizons because what it, what it will bring back to you is, uh, is, you know, three times what you put forth. Well, it's certainly, there. there's, you know, the saying, if you pick up a stick, you get both ends. On one hand, you're never bored. You're right. never stuck in a rut. On the other hand, and I was just speaking to a friend about this, by constantly pushing yourself and going past what your abilities are, definitely prioritizing a little bit of mental health moments can be important because you live in a state of constantly doing things that you suck at doing. And, <laughs> right. and so while on one hand, the benefit is that you're learning and growing and learning and growing. Sometimes, sometimes there are days where it's, where it's harder oh, yeah. to just be like, Oh my God, can I do anything right? So <laughs> I, and sometimes it's just a question of constantly bringing things into balance, but I, I'm certainly very much a proponent for myself first and for other guitar players to, to say that 
it's important, I think, to talk with other people about some of this stuff. I think sometimes people are loath to talk about the things that are challenging, maybe because they feel like it's revealing too much. But I, I've yet to meet a guitar player where if you don't sit down and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, what do you do with this? Or I'm struggling with yeah. just the, the what, what a drag it is sometimes to be online and have to respond to rude comments. I, I think it's something that the more that we can be, uh, that we can bask in the camaraderie that, camaraderie that we share as musicians, the more it helps all of us. So yeah, and, and there, you know, the one thing that helps propel some uh, the the world's awareness of what you're doing is the social media thing. That really, it it just mm -hmm. it is part of the thing. But there is, like you said, the stick that you're picking up. the The flip side, the opposite end, is you do have to um, deal with or choose not to deal with, um, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing. The haters that are out there that are not doing anything for them. So they're not in the game. They're right. strictly sideline folks yeah. that are just yeah. pulling things out there because they've got time to make comments on other people doing things because they're, they're not doing things for themselves, which yeah. is a sad thing, but be that as it may, it's exciting when I hear stories of somebody that's really pursuing uh, something that they're they're passionate about that is, is just again it's for the song really or for the, the your body of work your legacy so to speak mm -hmm. uh, I, what we had talked about prior to recording was the led zeppelin thing which is exciting to hear um i'm kind of curious as to um when you put together you were asked to join the band is that correct I well, when I found out that Clementine had this idea to start it, she so she, Clementine was the drummer for the first band I played in, which was okay. an ACDC tribute band. And oh. oh boy, did I not know what I was doing! Literally, my first real band. I mean, I'd played with people before, but in terms of like playing professional gigs, yeah, yeah. so I was as green as can be. It's kind of miraculous that I was allowed to play <laughs> in this band. And when Clementine said she wanted to start a Zeppelin tribute band, it was right after uh, the ACDC project had um, had been offered a really cool gig. I, it was like a few weeks with um, opening for Reverend Horton Heat. Oh. And because the other people in the band, it's like, you know, a band has, you have to have four or five or however many people on the same page with the same schedule. It right. didn't work out and she and I were kind of heartbroken about it and she wanted to start this Led Zeppelin thing really as a way to grow as a musician and then also to possibly be to put our name in the hat if 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 our other band didn't want to do certain gigs yeah. and I thought oh my gosh like I love ACDC and playing the Angus stuff is is great fun but you, you're in a similar situation when you get to play music that's like a guitar player's amusement park. I just knew there was so much I was gonna get to learn by playing Jimmy Page's stuff. It's not just one thing. I mean, he has a huge spectrum. And if you're brand new in your <laughs> career, you know, if you're just starting out and it's like, okay, you gotta learn slide. You gotta be able to play, you know, kind of heavy aggressive riffs, but also really beautiful, clean, quiet stuff and possibly acoustic things and all sorts of open tunings. And you have to, abuse a Les Paul with a violin bow. It's like, there's so much that you get to learn yes. and, and to have the accountability of playing that on stage to fans who are understandably very protective of music that they view as borderline holy, right? Yeah. There's, you just study harder and you, you have that accountability. And I knew I was going to learn a lot doing it. So I'm so grateful that, that Clementine took a chance on me. Yeah. It, it, like you said, there's so many different things that are amazing to do, whether it's the uh, altered tuning for like Rain Song or Friends or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Violin bow for Dazed and Confused or the slide thing for uh, yeah. when the, when the, uh, when the levy 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 is yeah. it levy, Le levy yeah when the when the levy breaks in my time of dying uh, yeah uh, what is and what should never be I mean that's right just, yeah I forgot about that I just he's talked a very complete musician in terms of what he did with electric and acoustic guitar he did a lot of stuff yeah do you break out the theremin for you know I did for a while uh only to find we don't travel with our own sound person do oh. you guys you probably do right do you have production okay 
We don't. We are lean and mean. We don't even have a tour manager. Well, Clementine, our drummer, is the band leader, is the tour manager. So we don't. I don't have a guitar tech. Nothing. And when I realized, all it took was like one or two times of the sound guy forgetting to turn <laughs> on the DI, and then me waving my hands around like a complete idiot. That I was like, "Good is luck." Is this helping? Good. Yeah. I, oh gosh. I mean, it's just like. <laughs> no, I know I could. Um, I know I can run it a little bit differently, but. At the same time, there's the practical aspect of we're driving ourselves to shows, we're setting up our gear, we're loading and unloading, we're doing our sound checks, and yet another instrument to to transport, load, unload, sound check. Theremins are small, so that's not a big consideration, but the time for sound check, a lot of times it means we don't get dinner. So right, exactly. uh, we, Very and that's why sometimes we do the acoustic set, sometimes we don't. The acoustic stuff, it's like it's double sound check for for me and for Anna, our singer. So yeah. sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. I have a theremin. I have a little instructional DVD on like how to play it properly. Not that, I mean, I think Jimmy kind of just went for it, yeah. uh, but it's a fascinating instrument. I keep feeling like one of these days, if I get a, a mellow month or something, I just want to like geek out on it. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, um, any, is there anybody from the Led Zeppelin camp that's been privy to what you guys do? We I've met Robert Plant a couple of times and he was very gracious. I, somebody passed a message along from Jimmy Page to me that was, you know, just a, like to give me his regards, um, which I, you know, you take that with a grain of salt, I don't know, uh, but I don't feel ever like I need to meet my heroes. I've been lucky that my heroes have been, the ones that I have met have been wonderful, like really, really wonderful. Yeah. But I also just feel like I, I spend so much time, I feel like in Jimmy Page's business of putting <laughs> my fingers where, he, it's like, I don't need him, I don't need more from him. You know, I don't need him to like talk to me or whatever. <laughs> like if he wants to, sure, I'm here, but like, uh, I already feel like I'm so up in his business that it would be creepy to be like, I need to meet the guy. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, it could, be, it could be a little awkward because it would, yeah. unless you were able to talk about something completely that had nothing to do with it and just talk yeah. about human beings, which probably more than likely if you did meet him, you probably end up talking about something completely. And, and that's been the case of when I've had really positive interactions with with some of my other heroes it's because there's a, a shared interest outside them you know it's like it's like i'm going to talk to my hero about and this album and this album and this album it's more like you find out that you both love django reinhardt or you know have a shared interest in something else right um we had be begun talking about uh the idea of uh sitting down and working out something for yourself in your own vernacular in terms of learning something, whether you write it out in standard notation or just memorize it. But uh, I would think with something as dense as that, um, it there was a little bit of a learning curve to, you know, to get all of the stuff because it, not only is it the acoustic stuff and the electric stuff, but it's also emoting on stage, you know, and getting into the persona of, because that could be a bit of a tricky thing when you're really trying to nail something to get into the, the the thing about david gilmore that i always enjoyed was not ever being somebody that would fit into spandex or grow my hair and be all the, the when scissor kicks off the drum riser david gilmore <laughs> was the perfect guy for me stand back in the fog and the smoke and the lights and the big circular screen but it would be um, a very daunting task because you know arguably jimmy was the most demonstrative one on stage yeah. Oh, he was playing some amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, having started with having to Angus on stage, which oh, yeah. for yeah. anybody who has ever been dismissive of what Angus does, I challenge them to, to play as well as he plays yeah. doing while he, what he's doing on stage. You'll have, you'll have a, a quite a deep respect. I mean, he was just fantastic. Uh, my neck was constantly in pain when I was in that band. Um, and I did have to run around and roll on my back and ride on shoulders through the crowd while soloing. So that was sort of a christening by fire, such that getting into Jimmy Page's more kind of chill swagger felt like a little bit of an 
ease off from that. But at the same time, one of the ways that Zeparella has chosen to, to present the music of Led Zeppelin, and I don't think there's a wrong way to do it if you do it with respect. So I'm not saying that our way is somehow um, better to any other take, but the way that we wanted to do it was kind of present it you know, the way a string quartet playing, you know, Bartok or Beethoven would, which it's like you show up, you look presentable, and you try to just get behind the music. Right. So we don't dress like them. We don't try to look like them. We don't, um, we don't emulate their antics, so <laughs> to speak. Yeah. I've seen people do it and they kill at it. Um, uh, James from Zoso is amazing as a Jimmy Page. He sat in with us and I was just like, I mean, he just channels it. So we, we have really different takes on it and yet we can, we can geek out together and, and yeah. I really appreciate how he does it. Uh, there's, I, I don't know, I've never seen a Zeppelin band that's touring do a bad job. Like, I feel like there's, yeah. there's all these different valid ways of presenting the music. So from, from our standpoint, we just try to be a good band right. playing Zeppelin. Yeah, and it's, for some people, they 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 want the whole experience and the costumes and all of that. So that's not us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, everybody has a um, it, it, whether it's a Rolling Stones thing or any of the legacy acts where there's a tribute thing involved. There, yeah. are, there's a, a wide variety of you know. Seem with the exception of Queen, it seems like almost every band that's doing the Queen thing wants to nail. The Freddie and Brian thing, at the very least, and have that. Right, right. I don't know that I've ever seen a, a group that does Queen where they're they're not trying to represent the the bright yellow jacket and the mustache, right. <laughs> whatever. Well, I think some bands really lend themselves to that. In, in yeah. the ACDC tribute band, like I was wearing a schoolboy outfit. I wore a school school girl outfit for like a couple shows until I'm like, this is sending a, a message that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's tricky, right? Don't want that, you know. So uh, I wore the schoolboy outfit, and I and and we did all this stuff. But but ACDC kind of begs you to do that. Zeppelin, I feel like they they were pretty minimalistic about their stage show and their presentation. And even when Jimmy went to the dragon suit, I mean, look at their early stuff. He's wearing an argyle sweater. You know what I mean? Oh, they yeah. were so about the music and they had this raw and that that's something that's so beautiful about Led Zeppelin. I mean, not to say that Kiss isn't fantastic in all of their crazy production, but we just felt that for doing Led Zeppelin that that we could really just dive into the music and then let let everything else go. Yeah. Yeah, they, I remember seeing like you saying Jimmy wearing the 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 sweater and then I remember seeing a thing where he's wearing like this pullover fisherman's cap and like this long <laughs> and some like weight and I'm like he looks like he's going you know fishing or duck hunting or something but yeah. he's on the with the less ball so yeah it's a, yeah I think what you get what you ladies are doing is fantastic because it's your own thing it's and it, it seems like you're representing yourselves doing the rather than trying to be the and, and that's kind of a refreshing thing mm -hmm. I think the idea for us was to try to just have it be like to, to have it be the music played by a cohesive band. I mean, and that's why we really don't, we really invest in each person who's in the band. You know, people who follow Zeparella, they know who Clementine is. She isn't just Zeparella's drummer. They know that's Clementine, you right. know, and 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 every time we've had a lineup change like there's definitely uh we've had we've been very fortunate to have all sorts of flavors of amazing come through the band and any band that's been together for more than a couple of years it's like sometimes you know whatever people's lives change and and there is a certain attachment that i think surprised me initially because at first i thought well the very nature of the existence of a tribute band is people being attached to the music, not to the people playing the music. And yet somehow in Zeparella, the the people who followed us for a number of years, they follow our other project. We all have original projects. Right. Zeparella just happens to, you know, 
as Be as you know, playing playing great music, you're playing great music, and just whether it's you playing Pink Floyd, me playing Led Zeppelin, symphonies playing, you know, Beethoven or Bartok or Stravinsky or Debussy, they, you know, you intersperse that with the the stuff that came out in 2023, or you know, by a modern composer. So the people who come to our shows, they they go and they buy our original stuff, and they come to our shows as well. So so we're pleasantly surprised with how much people who, are, who we didn't expect to have such open ears really do. Yeah. Do you do you experience that with with your band? Yeah. Well? Yeah. The, um, the first foray into doing that was uh, I went to see a Pink. I put the group together in 2008, and I had done some research, and I went to see another Pink Floyd tribute that was a couple hours away. And one thing that uh, struck me that was a little odd was that as you walked into the venue, the lights were up and there were people milling about on stage and they were, of all things, playing Joe's Garage by Frank Zappa. I love that and, album. Which I love the album, but it was kind of a weird thing because I walked in and it was, I was just, when I had seen Pink Floyd before or David Gilmore, the thing that I love was I, from the moment that I walked in, I was kind of immersed in this vibe. There was a vibe. There was no opening act. There was no, it was, it was more theatrical. And I feel like what we do is more theater than it is mm. rock and roll in some ways, because it's very much driven. It's like the narrator of our show is the big circular screen because we have full screen films for everything. But wow. what I was trying to say is um, I started from the very beginning writing music that was prelude music as people are coming in so as people come in the lights are down and there's like some ambient lighting and then it's songs that i wrote that are instrumental pieces that are very evocative of pink floyd or david gilmore um it kind of gets you in the mood so and then yeah. sort of wanting to know where they could get a hold of that music so they were they were already very receptive that sort of thing. And so in the, we all have, like you say, different projects, uh, but folks support that and are excited about it. It, 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 especially like the Guitar Hang podcast folks are, you know, you know, excited about uh, who who's going to be on the show and that sort of thing. So it's, it's wonderful when you get that kind of thing where they know they love the, the Led Zeppelin thing or the Pink Floyd, yeah. but they're also supporting what you do in a yeah. side of yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah. It's cool to, um, that you grew up in an area that I think would have been one of the more idyllic places to grow up as a musician, being the Bay Area, because such a fertile um, play, because there's so many shows that you can see and so many great musicians. Um, I was curious, did, did you know Jude Gold back then? Or is he I didn't, but he's one of my dearest friends. Um, yeah. I met I knew his name because of Guitar Player magazine. Yes. And I would often mix up Jude Gold and Joe Gore. I know yep. them both now. And in <laughs> fact Joe Gore is playing uh with the the symphony as well. The um he's part of this guitar collective called Another Night on Earth that that started yep. during the pandemic that I'm part of. Um and uh I met Jude when my one of my original bands, an instrumental band, opened for when he was playing in Hot for Teacher. And then we both found out that we were big Steve Morris fans. He started playing Cruise Missile downstairs. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, you know, I I inflicted my friendship upon him. <laughs> but he's he's fantastic. What a great player. I you know Jude? I don't know him personally. I love his podcast and yeah. aware of him through um uh guitar player magazine yeah uh, it was interesting because he uh i knew that he kind of grew up in an area where all the guys were kind of going to joe for lessons it was mm -hmm. charlie hunter and larry lalonde and jude and all these players that went on to do of course uh, mm -hmm. kirk hammett and mm -hmm. alex but it mm -hmm. what i would hear him describe as a community to grow up in, I thought, man, that's a that's a pretty cool thing to have all these guitar players come out of this particular area. And of course, the San Francisco thing looms large in anybody's knowledge of the history of rock and roll. You know, the the whole Bill Graham thing and the yeah, yeah, 
Fillmore and all that kind of stuff. And I, but I was just curious if, if because uh, I knew that I knew you you knew each other. I just didn't know if that predated the. Uh, no, no, no. That was um, when did I meet Jude? It was you know, maybe a little bit more than ten years ago, but not you know it was not like back when I started. Um, I was. Uh, I think probably the best thing about growing up in this area for me was that my dad took me to a lot of shows. So, so my dad, um, he worked at Guitar Player Magazine when I was a small kid. And then he- His name Don? Yeah. Don Man? You, know? you, did? oh you didn't know that. Um, I, oh I was always really careful not to, initially I kept it really quiet because I, my dad's a great guy, like the best. And he has a lot of goodwill and I didn't want any, I didn't want any, I didn't want to ride on his coattails. You know, I, I feel like I, I had more than enough advantages, you know, just being his oh. daughter, you know, and, and when I got interested in guitar, it's funny, people have such a hard time believing that it wasn't just shoved in my hands by my dad. But um, when, when I got interested in guitar, it was more that he was like, well, do you want to go to a show? I can, I can take you to see Joe Satriani. I know Joe. And I was like, okay let's go you know so it was more like that once i expressed interest it was like yes honey like i i you know i remember i remember getting like i remember him taking me sh like cd shopping when i was just getting into it and we went to tower records and we like went through all the cds and, and he was like okay if you like joe satriani and steve Vai, uh you need to and eric johnson you need here's a johnny winter cd and you need some jeff back and oh you need django reinhardt and oh, yeah. so I remember him just loading me up with these CDs of like, oh, I had Alan Holdsworth, you know, and all of these things. It's like, if, if you're liking guitar, here's the education. So it was like, basically, once I expressed the interest, he was like, here's your education. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that was huge. And so I got to go to some shows. And I think it was probably also really, really hard to estimate how important it was to be able to go and see like Steve Morse yeah. and to get to hang out with him, you know, as, as a kid and have him be so cool, you know? Yeah. And, and that, that happened because my, my dad had been, you know, a good guy who was good to people and help people out. And, uh, but also fortunately he let me discover it on my own. So I didn't have the baggage of like, I need to play guitar to achieve the love of my parents. You know, it was more like, it's more like, you like guitar? Thank God, here you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a very organic thing that was, yeah. yeah. The, the one thing I, I will say about uh, people like your father um, and Jazz Obrecht, who I just interviewed recently, Michael Molchenko, Joe Gore, uh, well, Jim Crockett, who started the, you know, guitar player. Those he folks- just died. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, two days ago or yesterday. But um, yeah. when you're coming up as a guitar player, um, pre-internet, pre-MTV, all that kind of stuff, for there to be a magazine that was, I, at any given, I, mean, I remember every year my mom would get me, um, she was a single mom, but she could afford to get me a subscription to guitar player. But each month was like a le uh, like a huge um, lesson on I could find out about Danny Gatton, I could find out about Lightning Hopkins, I could find out about uh, Joe DiOrio or Alan Holdsworth or you know all these different players, a myriad of players and every time I would read an interview it would take me down a rabbit hole of other people to check out. So that was my that magazine was huge. And those and folks like your dad were heroes to me, you know, Aww. because I, as soon as you said, man, I said, Don, man, okay, I, you know. So, oh, yeah, he'll be he'll be excited to hear that. I'll tell him. Yeah, I mean, so those those were, in fact, in some ways, they were every bit as important to your formulative view because they were, I didn't have any friends that played guitar. Uh, nobody in my family plays guitar. I was completely, I felt like I was just dropped into the jungle with a really shitty guitar. And I just had to figure my way I, <laughs> even before I knew how to tune the damn thing or which end to blow into. I was just completely lost in magazines, especially guitar mm. were incredibly helpful. So yes, thank you. Aww. 
I will. I'm going to see him this week. I'll tell him it'll mean it'll mean a lot to him. He, um, you know, like like anything, magazines get bought and people like Jazz and my dad get you know kicked to the curb. Uh, it, my dad had, had hadn't been a guitar player, you know, when I had started playing guitar. So, um, uh, not not that not that. He would have been the last person to try to give me any any advantages by by virtue of his position. He's the most ethical. Well, I've never met somebody more ethical, but it's been really nice because meeting Michael Melinda through Jude actually uh, is how I met Michael officially. Uh, and then what an incredible gift he gave me with this idea of the the Dante concept. Yeah, he was just the most wonderful creative partner in the whole thing and then max crace who did the photos i don't know if you know max he's a eric johnson was the first yeah. person that became aware of max. yeah 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 exactly so he manages eric he's done all of the artwork for mo most of eric's albums and so i got to work with just this dream team of people who i you know i'm, I'm forever grateful and, and that's actually how my dad and michael melinda ended up meeting was just through this new generation of people who had come into guitar player and then like, like anything people cycle in and out and magazines get bought and sold and all of that but there's such an incredible legacy and family of just some amazing people like you mentioned jazz obrecht tom wheeler was tom like wheeler. I, he was like an uncle to me um yeah. and we're still really close with his his family yeah um, but it's yeah i mean i've been i've been very very proud of all the the things that my my dad has done and continues to do he's a, he's a really brilliant writer i'm always on him to get his stuff finished and out there he likes to do a million drafts of everything and revisions i'm like get it done yeah i want to read it <laughs> that's right when you uh, are working on material for um well either this album or mm -hmm. ones that are coming forth are you putting down ideas like onto your iPhone or are you writing out certain things? I mean, how, what yeah. would be your creative process for putting together material? Sure. Uh, so I write in Sibelius. So I, um, I'm actually, I have two things that I'm working on juggling. Well, things did go, things got paused because of this opportunity to play with the Utah symphony and yeah. play a five movement guitar concerto that one of my heroes wrote for me to play like i'm gonna pause everything i possibly can yeah. to not bomb on that i mean what a uh, i think that's without question the greatest uh, professional honor so far oh, my. in my career it's just it's unthinkably cool yeah. so once that is done i will be revisiting uh an album that i have of mostly solo guitar with a few like duets or guitar and string quartet so a much more mellow guitar centric album and then after the the sadness of of realizing when once abandon all hope was done i loved the process so much and i learned so much and i was so happy to have had the amazing team i had work on the album and i was sad thinking like oh it's over and then i thought wait a minute the inferno is the first of the divine comedy so i'm working on purgatorio now and I, um, I have five tracks recorded with string quartet and I've incorporated woodwind trio mm -hmm. as well. And I think I just have two more pieces. It, it, it like abandon all hope is going to be an almost double length album with, you know, me giving it my full compositional effort. And so it takes a while especially as I'm juggling school and performing a concerto and playing live gigs and yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot. So, were, were you so I write, I realized I just talked a bunch and I didn't answer your question, no. <laughs> but your to your question, I write in Sibelius, which is a scoring program. And so I tend to like things in score form. And now that I, in some of the stuff I'm learning in school, is working more in logic with virtual instruments. So now I'm trying to balance the score with having a really a better mock up than you get with with note performer and Sibelius, which doesn't sound as good as some of the good virtual instruments. Yeah. Um, 
Are, are you familiar with the, there is a connection here. Are you familiar with David Gilmore's solo album called Rattle That Lock? I'm not. Should I be? I bet I should be. The central theme of that kind of his wife, right, Polly, writes a lot of the lyrics, but that was, and I'll have to send you this little booklet that came with the, uh, the album, but it was based off of, I believe, Dante's Inferno. Oh, really? So that there's a through line in that album, Rattle That Lock, which is his oh, most recent solo album that came out in 2015. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. It's kind I of, should check it out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's different than the, the um, it, it's it's a different through line than what you're talking, but it, I think there's a connection there. And anyway, I have yeah. to go the book because I saw the documentary and it, they included a book with the this little mini box set, and I thought that was pretty interesting. But um, there was something that you said that was uh, talking about meeting your heroes. Um, throughout my playing career, I've been fortunate to meet some, not all of my big heroes, but through this podcast, I've been able to meet uh, mm. so many really loving people like yourself that are just want to be uh, pay it forward and just be part of the whole community of things because mm -hmm. ultimately we are just standing on the shoulders of all of our heroes and it's it is a beautiful family tree kind of thing no matter where you fall into the in the grand scheme of things the fact that above and beyond anything else when i started playing i just wanted to be if i i thought it would be a huge success just to be considered a guitar player that my favorite guitar players would think, okay, you're one of us. So that I would be like, uh -huh. yeah, you just wanted to be in the hang. So yeah. yeah, I'd be interested to hear any of the, the musicians that were pivotal for you to kind of, you know, help you get to the next place or, or set you off in a different trajectory, whether it's uh, maybe mentoring you or if it was just inspiring steve morris obviously is somebody that you'd mentioned yeah yeah other to extract oh, yeah. concept for sure um <clears throat> well my first hero was eric johnson that's when i decided i need to pick up the guitar have you ever spoken to eric well I, I won't make this about maybe at the very end I'll tell you a really brief story about just how amazing he was. But yeah, I, I have had an opportunity to stand on stage with him when he sound checked. So I've told you the story already. Basically, I met him a couple of days before a show in Cincinnati in Dayton, and I just happened to have some Echoplex tapes that he was looking for, and he was on the road. Oh. Yeah. So I gave him those, and then he gave me some T-shirts and stuff, and I got to hang out for the sound check. But he, he and Steve Morris at that time in the late '80s, early '90s, were so kind to you know an early twenty-year-old mm. that they mm. were hugely impactful. But yes, so all that to say, go ahead. Yeah, well, I had the same experience. Um, I, I I got to meet Eric Johnson the night that I decided that I needed to play guitar as a show my dad took me to. I was like a kid and and he was so kind. And then same thing with Steve Morris. He was so unbelievably nice. And there that kind of humility combined with just yeah. unbelievable skills, I think got me really inspired, not just in terms of practice, but but seeing a connection between the quality of human and the quality of music. And it really, I think, got me thinking that who you are becomes how you play. And and not to neglect that aspect. If these if these two guys who are as good as it gets on guitar, there's different flavors of awesome, but I'm sorry, nobody's better than either of those, right? better in a different or good in a different way maybe but not better and if these guys are kind and humble and giving then i don't i guess i just saw that correlation between the two both of them are also very forthcoming about their their discipline and their work ethic and i think that was also important to hear it's it's really we have so much in our culture that is built into this myth of talent 
And I wonder how many people were dissuaded from following a musical path because they didn't, they weren't quick to pick up certain things that a teacher thinks is essential. The studies, if you've ever read like Peak by Anders Ericsson or uh, certain books that, that correlate, that, that really dive into what does go into expertise. Malcolm Gladwell talks, does a simplified version in Outliers when he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. But essentially the, the takeaway is if you can explain the, the terrifying skills of Mozart by looking at what were the opportunities, what was the education, what were the hours put into it, and if it starts to make sense when you really look at it that way, why would we, why would we make any predictions as to somebody's ultimate possible achievements because of what you might see in the first week or month or year even? And I think seeing that discipline and that devotion to musical excellence in my heroes right away made me less attached to the idea that if I got something quickly, that that was assurance that it was going to be smooth sailing, or if something was difficult, that that meant that was confirmation that I was not cut out for this. So I think it was important, not just for the inspiration, but also to see the, the quality of human beings. Uh, and then, you know, Jeff Beck was a revelation when I finally saw him live. He was a guitar player who I knew I was supposed to like. Yeah, right. But, but, I, but I grew up at a time where production was so far ahead of, of that stuff. I couldn't really listen to the old albums. And I kept trying and I kept trying. And I, I was like, God, it just sounds cheesy. I feel embarrassed saying that. But I say this is a hardcore Jeff Beck convert. And it wasn't until I saw him live. I, I went to see him live because Eric Johnson was opening for him. And I'm like, well, I got to see my hero open for his hero. So I actually flew to, it was, it was like Arizona. And, and it was my first rock show where I cried watching Jeff Beck play A Day in the Life. And I basically came home and, you know, built an emotional shrine to him and listened to everything. And so Jeff Beck was huge. And then uh, other people for sure, but most recently and even though it sounds kind of silly to say but I, I met my husband because somebody who knew what i was working on with the band and all hope and knew what he was working on with his album called non, non temperato was like gretchen have you ever met daniele gotardo and i was like the guy who does the shreddy stuff like i i knew him from a video that went kind of viral where it was an arrangement of the simpsons theme it was eight finger tapping and i it was really astounding but i had just sort of very stupidly assumed that because he was so technically astounding that that was what he did end of story and that's a mistake that I, it's like I feel like such an idiot for making that and yet it happens all the time we see one side of a person or a musician we assume that's all they do right little did I know that the reasons our mutual friend said you guys need to just geek out together is like me Daniele in his spare time does counterpoint exercises like like he, you know, like we, we look at each other's books and bookshelves and we're both super geeks, which in the realm of rock guitar is, there are not that many guitar players who come home from a gig and want to analyze, you know, a debut C score, but yeah. that was me, that was Daniele. And so as, as a result, we met just to, as fellow guitar geeks, um, we ended up getting married and he's just one of the most phenomenally skilled and of musicians of I've never known somebody of greater musical integrity the level to which this man works and pushes himself and is always just oh it's like he could he could be he has the skills to have a creative output output of lifetimes and he's still pushing to get better it's so inspiring slash annoying because he's so good already um but he he's every day i you know whether it's bouncing something off him or asking for his advice or just sharing musical ideas there's probably there's nobody who's had a bigger musical impact on me than him yeah that's fabulous yeah that's a a story yeah i got i got lucky i I definitely i hit the jackpot in the in the spouse (laughs) department yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that he played on the recording, which is pretty awesome. Yes. He played he played bass, which he doesn't even play, but he 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 and the drummer were the two who I I gave the most 
leeway to coming up with their parts. Thomas Perry has been the only drummer I've used for my, um, basically once I started playing live and he, he's somebody, he's just almost psychic when it comes to like, I'll send him a, like a, the most ridiculous sketch of a drum part. I'm like, can you make this an actual part? And he's like, he gets it. Like yeah. if it's not the first time, it's the second time. And Daniele understands counterpoint and orchestration so well that, you know, when we really went into getting the bass parts, you know, he would, he's able to look at the score, read the score, see it with all the other instruments, see how it, the interplay is with like the cello and, and we can have some of those discussions. So he was amazing to have on that too, but his, his album that just came out inkblot, if you haven't heard that, it's, it's so That's inkblot. Inkblot. Okay. Oh. Inkblot. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah. It's it's some of the most insane. I've never heard a guitar album like that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 That's a yeah. beautiful thing to have that shared. My wife plays piano and, and is learning guitar, but just uh, she doesn't want to do it to the degree that I, but the fact that you have that shared thing, it's the, whether it's literature or nature or those things, it's the things yeah. that bond you. We met later in life. Uh, mm. We're both 58. We met when we were 56. So it's to, to meet your person later in life and have all those shared things is a beautiful thing. So that's Aww, you're describing so it's beautiful to, to have that. Uh, we're lucky because for a while I, I thought like, no, no, I, I can't date musicians because, you know, early on, you know, I had a couple of boyfriends who were musicians, but they were less serious about it than I was. And that caused like, like there was a thing like it wasn't a thing for me but it was more like it was a thing for them uh so i kind of thought oh may maybe this is the wrong way to go but with daniele like there's he, <laughs> he's so much better than everyone <laughs> that it's like it's it's not a thing you know like he's there's no way to threaten him and not because he's he doesn't have any ego whatsoever he's just he's so incredibly disciplined and so uh, generous, you know, he loves nothing more than if I call him and I'm like, hey, in fact, one of our things I know if he's in a bad mood, I will be like, hey, you want to come in and like criticize my voice leading, you know, because I'll have like a, a new passage, you know, like written out and one of his favorite things is to go through and like scrub through some of my parts and then we'll get into heated debates over whether whether you know, the, the conventions of 16th versus 18th century counterpoint are more in line with what I'm trying to do. So it's like there's a level of speaking a, a rare language that that we can do that's that's super fun so um so i feel i feel incredibly lucky and uh and and, and always inspired there, there's like i said there's nobody who's had a greater and more lasting and continuous impact on on me creatively yeah that's a, that's a, a beautiful thing i would love to talk to him at some point that'd be great oh to... you absolutely should he's 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 one of the most hilarious oh, just uh, pure souls you'll meet it's wonderful that your wife is also a creative person like, yeah do you guys she, play together yeah i mean we, we'll sit down and play guitar a little bit and she's learning she she picked her family is very musical unlike mine i i, I didn't have that thing but her, yeah. um she's an, has an italian family and that, that was a big thing for them getting around the piano singing songs beatles tunes Mm. whatever very musical rich thing so for her it was a probably a different thing to sit down there was no preconceived thing like she was putting a big stress on herself for me some of my biggest hurdles were the fact i wanted it so damn bad and i rev myself internally like if i if i can't play too many notes off the steve morris album oh, God. who can play that <laughs> You know that you know, well, my, my buddy Andy Wood just can shred the hell out of that. Oh, Andy's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that there's something to be said for not getting. Uh, when you're younger, you tend to. Because I started later in life. I mean, I mm. I didn't get my first guitar in earnest until I was 20 or 21. So for somebody oh. to make a career starting that late was a little un un unusual. Frank Zappa started when he was 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there you go. And Wes, Wes Montgomery started when he was 20, 21. 20? Yeah. Although yeah. I'm neither Frank nor Wes, but I love them both. But anyway. But you're you. But you know, but the point, I, yeah. I feel like one of the most important things is that it's like, as guitar players, especially today, we're so inundated with 
other people who are so amazing that that I think the risk of that on one hand, it can be very inspiring, but the risk of that is that it can make us feel unworthy of actually putting out into the world what our own out or what our own creative muses tell us to do. And right. and yet I think how grateful are we that Wes Montgomery oh, yeah. went for it? How grateful, I mean, what would the world be like if Jeff Beck had decided that he wasn't worthy of, you know, <laughs> playing and recording? We never think of it as a selfish thing when the people who inspire us do it. And yet we're made to feel sometimes like it's this like this egotistical endeavor rather than it's it's your it's you bringing the best parts of yourself to the world and offering it for people to take or leave yeah. and if you think of all the things that humans can put in the world music's about as as pure of the thing it doesn't even take up space you know that's for sure it's and it's that thing that uh comparison is the thief of joy you know a hundred percent yeah so. yeah yeah. Well, the, the time has just flown by. Thank you so much. You've oh my gosh, you're such a joy to talk to. Aging conversationalist, a delightful musician. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Thank, Thank you for tuning in to the Guitar Hang podcast, interviews with noteworthy guitar players from around the world. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications to stay updated on our latest episodes.